Awesome. Hi then, Khalil. Thanks for uh, taking the time to join me today. Um, look, just to introduce you, it'd be great to speak to you because I know you've successfully transitioned from a permanent position to a fractional tech advisor. So um, it would be great to understand uh, how you've done that and to uh, pick your brains on that. But I was wondering if you could just tell us and the audience a bit about yourself. Sure, yeah. Hi, Leo. Um, so I, a bit about myself, I have uh, been in the tech industry in London for about 18 years now. Uh, started out as a developer, kind of uh, getting exposure to pretty much every part of the stack, which was super useful, and then transitioned into the kind of architecture function. Um, and I was lucky enough to do that uh, just as kind of cloud computing was becoming a mainstream kind of thing that's adopted by businesses. And so um, I did a lot of my kind of architect work in uh, cloud migrations and optimizing cloud systems, et cetera, things like that, which was was really uh, handy because that later exploded, as, <laughs> as you well know. It's actually yeah. really rare to find someone not on the cloud now. Um, and then after that, I started working uh, with clients. Uh, so I worked in consultancies and started working with uh, customers on their tech strategies, etc. So I've worked with the likes of BP, Visa, uh, Maserati was one really interesting one as well on this kind of like, you know, making better use of tech in their operations. And then I transitioned into the CTO space and, and um did a couple of startups, uh, did a rescue or two as well. Um, luckily, I've, I don't know if it's uh, luck or what, but I've been uh, pretty successful in scaling startups and getting them either kind of sold or invested into the level where I can kind of move on and do something else. And that's where I started doing more rescues and interim work. And then it seemed like the natural step to kind of go into business on my own and, and have more of a consulting um, kind of approach. So now I'm doing like fractional CTO and tech advisory uh, work with uh, multiple clients. Yeah, well, it does seem to be the, the move that a lot of people are taking at the minute. Um, so what in your experience then, what do you think um, the best things for maybe a startup uh, to get investment on board would look like? Because obviously that's where you've pinpointed it most recently, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of that has to do with the with the financial and uh, kind of global climate in general. Uh, I think investment cycles go through kind of uh, ebbs and, and and peaks and uh, peaks and troughs basically, and and it's like now we're very much in a down cycle I think when it comes to investment. So it's even more difficult now I think as a startup to to get investment. So the key is focus really the key is really knowing what your value proposition is and um, you know that sounds probably pretty easy especially for a startup founder listening to this but it's a lot more difficult than you expect because a lot of times what you think your value proposition is doesn't align with what the market then accepts as your value proposition or what an investor accepts as your value proposition and, yeah. and a lot of that has to do even with what investors are looking for you know, within the current economic climate, what fits within their portfolio, what size of investor, are we looking at private equity, are we looking at VC or angel? And uh, my advice to early startups is to always start going, uh, try and get initial angel funding because it's just a lot easier to obtain. Uh, it tends to be, you know, there tend to be easier conversations to have and um, angels basically gamble on the fact that someone else is gonna invest in you and they'll recoup their money well before kind of your business proposition matures. And yeah. so, you know, they're, they're, they're in some ways they're more uh, risk averse, but in other ways they're actually more willing to put in the money because we're talking about smaller chunks of money that'll enable you to kind of get started. I think one of the keys though to securing investment really is um, having a really focused and really good demonstrative uh, MVP. I think, um, sorry, you're breaking up a bit. Can you hear me okay? Yes, can you? Yeah, great. Um, so yeah, the MVP side is key. And one of the things I found when working with startup founders a lot is you'll sit down and you'll go, okay, so um, what do you want to do? How do you want to get started with your product? And they'll have a list of 10, 15 things that they want to do. 
And it's like, yeah. okay, but what do we want to focus on? Oh, well, all of it. But realistically, you can't do that. Even if, you know, you think everything is super linked because you have finite that runway, you need to get the investment quickly. Um, getting an investment on its own is a process that's going to take you between anywhere between three months to eight months to 12 months. Uh, you never really know. Even yeah. if we're talking about small amounts by angels or grant funding, grant funding can be another really good one to extend your runway as a startup. And there's some really good Innovate UK grants. Uh, but in order to do that, you need to really have an MVP out quickly and be able to iterate on it to find that fit. And unless you narrow down kind of the things that you want to do in your MVP to like maybe two or three at the most, you're not going to have that focus and that quickness to market and that ability to iterate quickly. And one of the right. ways that you can choose as well is to just do some light prototyping, you know, use no code, even just mock things up, test them with the representative user groups and see what they think and do some of the iteration before you even invest in the build. Um, I find startups with a really strong MVP proposition that's well-defined where they can really articulate the, what, what sets them apart are the ones that more easily raise initially. Because um, the other thing is investors tend to invest in people, yeah. not just the tech. And so if you can show that you know, you're focused, you have a clear strategy and you understand the challenges that are coming up. So not just going, yeah, we're great. We're going to kill it. We're going to dominate the market. And investors are going to be looking at you and thinking, oh, you're a child. <laughs> you know, you need to be realistic, understand yeah. what the risks are and be able to articulate that as well. Um, so it's it's kind of the combination of the two. OK, and no, it's interesting. It's useful um, to keep that in mind. I think for the other aspects of it is what would be the key strategies as well that they would probably mm. need to undertake whilst going through that to make sure that the yeah. business is ultimately a success. Uh, while going through the actual funding round. Yeah, well, just, yeah. yeah, the funding round and just making sure that the business actually mm. keeps on track and ultimately yeah. engages with the market. I think it's about runway management. And this is also where I see a lot of startups um, kind of be um, overly optimistic as to how far their runway can go. And I think you need to be very pessimistic. I think right. you need to... Figure out how far your runway gets you and then subtract a quarter from that. <laughs> and then and then work towards that goal because you never know what's going to come up. It's going to cost you a little bit more. Uh, optimizing your initial kind of MVP build, your initial team. Uh, you know, um, a lot of times you'll hire on too many roles that you don't necessarily need at the beginning. So really plan out how you want to scale up. Uh, you know, only pay for what you really need right now. And I tend to say, um, like, get in senior engineers really early. Um, I think even though they'll cost you a little bit more, they'll actually, because they have that experience and that architectural knowledge as well, they'll be able to build things much faster and build things that are more robust and can be kind of extended into real product later on than a very junior person who you might be able to get five of versus like two seniors, but are gonna be learning on the job and iterating a lot and might actually really slow down your MVP build. I think mm -hmm. until at least you have something deployed and you understand your strategy and you understand your funding strategy, you should really try and go as senior as you can. Okay. Um, you know, and often you can get these people uh, for cheaper if you put in more equity um, as an incentive for them, whether that be in options or or in just kind of founding equity. Okay, that's some really useful advice for for people thinking about going down that startup mm -hmm. route. Um, as I said, there's a lot of people which are moving into that market now, um, certainly within the tech advisory space. So. So great, great to get your opinion on that. And for you then, uh, Khalil, what is, um, what's been the biggest tech challenge, do you think, for you uh, in the past year, either with that transition that you've made mm -hmm. or, or before? I think um, I haven't had a lot of tech challenges, to be honest, uh, mostly because I've been working in domains that I really know very well, right? Yep. And a lot of my engagements this year have been around data and data strategy, 
uh, making good use of kind of disparate data sources that you have to make intelligent business decisions. And this is something I've worked on throughout my career, really. So I think the, the main challenges that I've been tackling have been around simplifying, aggregating, and making really good business use of data, and also making the business stakeholders understand the challenges involved and, and the timelines in doing that. Because a lot of times you'll think, oh, I have all of these data channels. You know, why can't I just like within a week or two get something useful up? But actually, yeah. there's a lot of plumbing to be done, you know, and, and there's a lot of kind of data analysis and data transformation to be done before you can actually use it for different types of use cases. So the data challenge is definitely a big one that I'm seeing a lot this year. Uh, but it also could be because I've been working with more, slightly more mature, kind of more on the scale up side than the startup side companies. Okay. And I think that's probably also why, because that tends to be a tech challenge that you hit at that stage of your growth. Uh, because actually, I find the startup uh, ecosystem is slowing down a lot, which is really unfortunate because, you know, the UK used to be such a fertile ground. There's still a lot, but there's I've definitely seen a, 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 a slowdown. I think um, in terms of real challenges, it's been the operational stuff. It's right. been the going out um on my own kind of setting up my own business doing all of that admin and having to have an accountant and all of the legals <laughs> around it and all of that has been honestly a bigger challenge than any tech stuff this year yeah well yeah because it's uh it's a big transition to make isn't it mm, yeah um, from it is so, it's uh, motivating though i'm finding to be honest i i find myself actually less stressed and less tired than when i was firm because I'm, wow. I think, more motivated, because I'm able to choose the work that I love to do and, yeah. and work with the organizations that I really want to work with. You know, that I've been fortunate from that side. So it's actually quite motivational. And I find myself to be just a lot more engaged. No, that's good. Yeah, I suppose you get the chance to pick what you work on, ultimately. Mm. Um, yeah, somewhat. I mean, you still need to kind of, you know, bring, bring the revenue in. But, yeah, yeah, true, true. I suppose um, within tech trends, because obviously they are ever present, really, and obviously mm. with the inclusion of ChatGPT uh, recently. So what do you think the trends are going to look like over the next couple of years? Do you think that you would you would need to be involved in and, and would tackle? Um, I think... The next couple of years are probably going to be mostly about consolidating all of the stuff that's kind of been building up. And what I mean by that is I think the whole um, large language model thing, you know, has really suddenly burst into the consciousness, uh, the public consciousness. And I think we're actually still at quite early stages with it. Um, that's going to develop really quickly and just gain a lot more capability. And I think it's going to be around how you can leverage it to automate things that you haven't been able to automate before. Because I think, you know, there's a lot of like sales channel automation stuff now and like data automation. And just in terms of uh, there's a lot of customer support, you know, chatbots have been around for a while and been fairly competent. But I think this is going to go to the next level and enable you to automate a lot more stuff and then enable you to also uh, provide potentially your employees with much more powerful tools to aid in their work. You know, I, I'm not kind of very alarmist about this stuff. You know, a lot of people are like, that's it. AI is taking over. No yeah. more jobs. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, really, uh, what you'll see is that kind of panic happens every time there's kind of a big thing in the public consciousness. But really, you just develop tooling out of it that probably enables you to do more in your job. And then this is where I see that going. Uh, you know, okay. I know I use it a little bit. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, it's actually, it makes for a good uh, pair programming partner, to be honest, Chad. <laughs> I hadn't thought about it like that. But yeah, we've, yeah. we've seen everyone use it now, isn't it? I think it's exactly. kind of like a go-to extension. But Yeah, or for suppose... like optimizing the tone of your messaging. It's really excellent. So that's one of the trends that I think will be strong. I think data continues to dominate everyone's minds yeah. uh, and, and the utility of just getting a really good view and really good automation and AI into your kind of data processing function uh, continues to be just have outsized returns in terms of the effort that you put in. 
Yeah. And so I think in the next few years, data is going to be um, a big, big focus, even more than before. And you'll see a lot more demand for data scientists as well. OK, no, that's interesting. I suppose with the AI uh, part of it that you've mentioned, mm -hmm. where you've mentioned obviously the pair programming element, um, which is, yes, I think that would be useful for sure. It's just where else do you think in the main business applications could AI really be useful for? Uh, I think lead generation, uh, competitor analysis, all kinds of market research, anything where you need to compile a bunch of data into actionable points or into kind of insights, it's really good at. Uh, anytime, you know, research, as a research assistant, it's great, uh, but you need to make sure that you're double checking everything <laughs> now. <laughs> um, I would say actually generative AI is, is making kind of those steps as well. So, you know, it could potentially really disrupt the whole, you know, stock photography and, and, and being having to actually kind of make um, assets for okay. when you're actually, you know, so uh, the, to do custom designs and whatnot. I've even seen some really good generative AI that's able to generate product videos with completely fake people that don't actually exist talking about the product and stuff. And we're getting to really advanced stages with that. So I think from a content generation perspective, that's going to just keep accelerating as well. Now, I didn't put that as a higher priority in terms of what's going to be important in the next two to three years, mostly because the legalities around it are still untested and, un and not really fully understood. Yeah. You know, how much of the source data tr that's training that AI, what influence does that have in terms of copyright, intellectual property, in terms of you know commercial usage of stuff? There's a lot of test cases happening now, and I think we won't really know, and we won't know how the legal framework is going to settle around all of this stuff yet. So that's the only reason, kind of, I'm holding back on saying you know that's going to be have a huge impact in the next two to three years. But I think in the next five years or so, yeah, once that's all settled. Okay, and would you align those those data, the AI aspect of things, being the most in demand skills? Do you reckon over the next couple sure. of years, or 100%. would you would you think anything else would add into that bracket, or would you just be be thinking those? Yeah, two? I think if we want to get granular as well, it depends how much you want to zoom out too. Because I think if you look at granularly, for example, within the tech industry, within programming, etc., I think things like uh, so some of the newer languages uh, like uh, Go, Rust, for example. They're gaining a lot of popularity, and I think they'll keep kind of get, gaining popularity because they are uh, really good interpreted languages that are easy to program in that actually are fast. And so that you know that it's kind of the holy grail that, <laughs> that's been. <laughs> you know. But um, so there's a lot of that happening, definitely. Um, so I think from that side of things, I think uh, other than that, you've got. I, it's a little farther out, but you've got the whole kind of metaverse side of things, uh, which you know is a, to a whole other uh, topic that you want to dive into. I have some strong opinions on that. <laughs> yeah, because I was gonna. That's one of the questions I wanted to ask really as well. Was um, what changes might you see in businesses in ten years due to obviously the the metaverse um, coming into play? Uh, I. I... It's a difficult one to tell you the truth. I think there's a huge amount of potential. Yeah. I think the problem is we're still quite limited by the limit of um, modern engineering. And what I mean by that is, for example, for it to really have a huge impact in kind of the mainstream, in business especially, I mean, you already have some kind of, kind of augmented reality devices, virtual reality being used in industry. And, and even in medicine and, you know, in, in kind of niche areas where it's worth making the investment and the encumbrance of using it is in, you, you know, it, it will actually have a good kind of return on investment rather than just be an encumbrance. I think the problem is we're still very limited by hardware. I think a good example is look at um, Apple's new preview, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm sure they would have loved to have something like this. Yeah. <laughs> but they can't. And, and, and the reason is that um, they had to go ski goggles, you know, which actually I think is a good paradigm. I, I, you know, I think they thought, okay, 
what do people what's a bulky thing people have on their faces that doesn't creep other people out yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's just do that and it's it's actually clever the problem is um out of all of the technologies that uh kind of bottleneck this stuff it's battery yeah. and battery chemistry battery physics is a huge area of research and every once in a while you think oh there's going to be a great you know really promising tech great breakthrough but it never really materializes when you look at engineering it at scale yeah and, and as long as batteries are honestly kind of this primitive we're gonna struggle you know you have to have bulky things you have to plug things into battery packs you have to um and and i think that it's not even the processing power it is really the the uh, the battery the the electrical engineering part um i think if we had the battery tech in place the processing power even can can be addressed you know you can have a distributed system your your goggles can use your phone's processor uh, and can use you know maybe even over the internet can use your pc at home to process heavy workloads and you know mesh processing and yeah. kind of distributed computing i think has a huge potential in this area especially since what we're looking at here is the birth of spatial computing right yeah. so it's all about how you interface with a 3d space in terms of information and it's it's super interesting it's a completely different type of calculation it's a completely different type of design paradigm um, but it's all quite limited now because of battery physics which is unfortunate <laughs> yeah because it all boils down to that yeah it, ultimately yeah. that and circuitry right um you could probably do microcircuitry that can fit in a much smaller box but it's going to be so expensive and you have the economies of scale and you know the fact that you need to sell this thing to consider and so we're almost running faster than we can handle we're we're a bit in the future currently in, in terms of thinking of these things i do think it's going to make a huge impact i just think it's not mature enough yet okay no yeah it's interesting you fundamentally it boils down to the battery uh battery side of things isn't it than, mm. uh, rather than the actual equipment itself but um the other thing just to bring it back to the data side that you mentioned how do you think as technology advances really what can we use or how can we better use data to support our business decisions, do you think? Uh, by zooming out, uh, much like everything else when it comes to tech. Uh, I think the problem is, like I said, you have disparate and really kind of very um, specific and very uh, narrow data points that are collected into kind of systems. And then you just, what you have to do is you have to extract the value out of that and figure out how to transform that to have to, to apply to your business goals and to be able to actually enable you to do things easier. I think one of the traps you can fall into with data is to overcomplicate your kind of data system a lot. Mm. And then it ends up being a lot more effort and maintenance than the value that it actually gives you. And I see that a lot. Like I'll walk into, I'll, I'll be talking to a client and they're like, oh, we need to, you know, use BigQuery or like some other huge kind of database infrastructure. And we need to use the latest AI and the latest kind of uh, BI tools. And, and then you look at their actual use case and, and you're thinking, well, no, but you can save like 70% by, you know, going with something that fits a lot more your use case, but isn't as flashy and, and as uh, full of uh, yeah, kind of bu <laughs> buzzwords and catchphrases, you know. Uh, that's actually something I've been doing recently a lot where, I, you know, I'm going, wait, let's look at what we have and let's build it up in steps. Um, yeah. You know, first organize your data, get your insights, understand your actionable stuff, then put in the uh, machine learning, the time series prediction, the things like that that are easy wins when it comes to machine learning. And then you can go a little further. But there's a lot that can be done. And there's a lot that can optimize business. I mean, I, I like I said, I've worked in consultancy a lot. And, you know, I've worked with industrial companies where we've optimized their, like, logistics routing and their the way they do maintenance. And when you uh, bring in also computer vision into the equation, it becomes really powerful as well because then you can train something to recognize um, for example, wear and tear on certain mechanical parts and then, you know, be able to optimize the logistics of having your people 
uh, maintaining uh, mechanical parts within industry where they don't have to kind of waste time or or even something like um, power power lines and and yes. and and, uh, and things like that you can predict when they're going to need maintenance and optimize your routing so um yeah there's a lot but of they- operational optimization in in ai and that's all driven by data and, yeah. and you need a large amount of data, but you also need quality data. Your data points need to be consistent and you need to be collecting the same ones every time. And often that's where people fall over. That's where the system, the, the systems are weakest that I look at often. It's in the, date, the core data quality. And if your core data quality isn't good, the analytics coming out of it is not going to be good. And is that been looking at the businesses you you're helping or have worked mm. with in the past? Obviously, data plays a big part of that. But what also has been the the main business problems? Do you think that have been uh, challenging, or you've had to tackle maybe this year or or in the past? And and how has that really looked like? And how have you gone about doing that? I mean, it's mostly around both operational and cost optimization. Like. Okay. Let's understand what's costing us the most. Let's understand where the biggest bottlenecks are, and then let's figure out how to resolve those. Right, and that's what that's what kind of this type of analytical data is best at. And then the next step is okay. Let's then try and make our forecasting more um, more accurate. Let's try and predict what's going to happen, etc. Um, you know, from that side of things, you can do a lot now with actually, uh, you know, quite. Uh, not not a huge amount of data either. Yeah. I actually know a startup that's doing um, time series prediction, uh, where they can like predict the, uh, let's say, crowding in the tube or uh, like the movement of people based on time series historic data with with fairly little data. Oh wow, that's good. That, that'll be interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, interesting to see certainly in London anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they did work with TFL on on. Uh, crowd prediction on the tube actually right well well i can certainly say mondays and fridays are less uh less problematic for me um but the <laughs> midweek that's where it gets a bit too yeah, much yeah exactly <laughs> i suppose and then also just to find out a bit about yourself uh, i'd like to finish these interviews with uh, a couple of personal things as well so mm. what's been your 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 favorite tech invention in all times you think um Favorite, if if we look at kind of impactful, really, it has yeah. to be uh, the micro circuit uh, and the microcontroller, uh, because without being able to get rid of all the big wires and vacuum tubes and whatnot, we wouldn't have anything that we have now, right? So yeah. I think honestly, uh, it, it is the micro circuit. <laughs> um, but on a more personal level, it's probably you know something that resulted out of the invention of the micro circuit, which is the uh, personal computer, because that's basically what has driven kind of my whole life from when I was a child <laughs> to, you know, my, my, the career that I've had. Um, yes. Yeah. Oh, no, and and it's funny because it's part of that cycle. So I have a theory about the way that technology moves and, and you can see it happening all throughout kind of since we've started really innovating with tech, where you have things that are where, where basically you have the big bulky monolithic systems like what used to be mainframes, et cetera. Then you have some kind of breakthrough that allows you to split that up. And then you end up with like, for example, the personal computer, et cetera. And then it becomes a bit more bulky again. And then you split it up and then you get things like the phone, et cetera. Yeah. And then you're going even further, you start having like internet of things. So you put more sensors and little devices. So it's always like this, uh, there's this kind of cycle of uh, we have a big machine and then we can separate like the screen, the keyboard and the machine. And now we have that, the biggest yep. point being like the PC and then we can split that up further. And then eventually it's going to all be environmental distributed computing. And that's where really the metaverse side of things comes in. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's going to be an interesting uh, evolution for sure. Yeah. Um, and then on the flip side of that, Looking at obviously there's a popular TV show, the tech, um, the tech room 101 or mm-hmm. room 101. What would you um, like to dis- disregard, never see again within tech? <laughs> Might be a few <laughs> things, but what yeah. Do you think, yeah. Um, honestly, I have a particular hatred of printers. 
Like they're All loud. Right. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> they need a lot of maintenance. They keep running out of ink. They've now become a subscription model. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know? And honestly, the the quicker we can get rid of printers, <laughs> the, the better. <laughs> well, also saves on the environment, doesn't it? Sustainability. Yeah, exactly. And that side of in tech obviously is a big thing, but um. Yeah, they, they used to be huge, huge pieces of equipment mm. back in the day. Um, but no, that's been really useful, uh, Khalil. I really appreciate uh, the time that you take. I think should help with really guidance for people who are looking to to get within, involved in startup or, or startup on their yeah. own as well. As and honestly, I think if anyone's kind of getting into tech now, I think really the the best area to focus on is something very data related. You know, yeah. either look at if you're more kind of mathematically inclined i think the you know ai machine learning etc side is, is amazing to, uh, and of an area to get into um and but you know the data and the data quality is what drives it all and so i only see more and more of a need for data scientists and ones that you know can actually um do programming and understand you know, software development and understand um, the the core tenets of technology. Yeah, okay. No, yeah, I think um, we definitely see that. Uh, it's definitely one of our busiest areas, us as a business as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, for anyone else that's watching this, um, planning on trying to put together a round table with Khalil uh, for people who are interested in moving into the fractional world um, as he's successfully uh, taken that path. But um, look, thank you very much, Cleo, for your time and uh, appreciate you uh, uh, running us through your thoughts. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you.